Can anybody hear me? Can anybody hear me? Okay, thank you for letting me know that you can hear me. Today is a little bit different because I am in Mozambique uh, working on a project and my internet is spotty. So hopefully it will uh, get us through. And of course, uh, I'm on a different time zone. It is uh, 10 o'clock here. So, or yeah, 10 o'clock, I think. My computer says 11, but it's only 10 o'clock. So I am going to get started because we are on the top of the hour and it's a long presentation. So uh, let's see, Oops, come on. see anybody right. trying to do this on my laptop okay. here right now you should be seeing me I'm going to share my screen Oops. Function. Yeah. Okay, can everybody see my um, my presentation? Oops. Okay, so I'm hearing you. I'm seeing lots of yeses. So I'm going to assume that means you can all see me. Okay, uh, with this setup here, I cannot um, follow the chat or the Q&A very well. Um, so we'll leave all the questions to the end. Uh, my name's Dr. Jackie Jacob. I work at the University of Kentucky, although as I said at the beginning, I am currently in Mozambique. Uh, my broadband um, width is very low, so no, photo, no video today, so that I can hopefully uh, get this thing to stay up the entire time that I am here. So uh, today's topic is an overview. Um, and all sorts of things. Okay, so uh, today's topic is an overview of uh, poultry anatomy. Mostly we'll be talking about chickens. Um, poultry are pretty much the same, um, minor modifications. So uh, starting with the digestive system because uh, poultry, I mean, feed is the main, um, expense when you are uh, taking care of chickens. Um, so that's where we're gonna start. Um, so the digestive system, the chickens, poultry in general are non-ruminants. So cows, goats, sheep, those are ruminants. They have a rumen that helps them to digest grass. So the cow, goat, or sheep themselves cannot digest the, the grass, they have this that of microorganisms, which does the digestion for them. Chickens do not have a rumen. They are considered a monogastric, uh, which basically means single stomach. Um, so as a result, chickens cannot digest grass. Poultry in general cannot digest grass. So although waterfowl, especially geese, are often uh, raised on pasture, uh, they simply consume a lot of it to help get the, some of the nutrients that they require. So it's not that they can digest better than chickens, it's just that they consume more in order to be able to get any of the nutrients um, from the material. 
So let's start at the mouth. Uh, everybody knows chickens have a beak, no teeth. Um, and they use their tongue to push food that they consume uh, to the back of their mouth. If you uh, try to swallow, you'll notice that you have to close your mouth or have your tongue up at the, the uh, top of your palate so that you can create a vacuum in order to swallow. Chickens cannot do that. They cannot create that vacuum in order to swallow. Um, so they push the feed and uh, it works its way down the esophagus. And the reason they can't swallow is because they have a cleft palate. Um, so if you watch chickens drink, for example, they will put their beak in the water to get a mouthful, then they will lift their head up and let gravity uh, take the water down, which is why commercially they a lot of the farmers use nipple drinkers. It takes uh, advantage of the natural behavior of chickens to raise their head to get the water. It's a closed system, so it's a cleaner water. You tend to get less spillage. Um, so the poultry in general, birds in general, have uh, a cleft palate. So uh, if we start at the beginning of the digestive tract, once the chick the bird uh, consumes the food, gets it down the esophagus, it goes into the crop. And the crop is basically a um, storage facility. So um, birds in general, unless they're a raptor, are a prey animal. And so they like to be able to get their food and then go and hide and digest it. So that the crop allows to them for doing that. Um, if you look at the different poultry species, wild versus some of the domestic ones, you'll see minor variations in the crop. Um, so uh, a raptor that eats fish, for example, will have a totally different type of, I mean, it will have a crop, but it, you know, the food tends to, you know, the whole fish goes through. And the uh, crop is located on the outside of the, the chicken near the neck region. Um, it does secrete some mucus, which helps lubricate the, the dry feed. It also mixes feed with water that the birds drink. Uh, water is extremely important for food consumption. Chickens typically will not eat if they can't drink. So uh, they need to have access to water in order to be able to eat. So if you see a drop in feed consumption, uh, a lot of people think, oh my God, I must have a disease problem because a drop in feed consumption is one of the first signs of uh, a problem, but it could just be the water lines are broken and they're not getting any water. So um, always make sure, you know, if you have a drop in feed consumption that you first check and make sure all the equipment is working. The fact that the crop is on the outside of the body cavity makes it easier to verify feed intake of young chicks. When placing chicks, you want all of them to have found food uh, within 24 hours. So, you know, every few hours you can check the bird's crop to make sure that it has feed in it. And by the time 24 hours is up, every bird you check should have feed in the crop. So if you see the one on the left, it has feed in the crop and the one on the right does not. So uh, it may be that they never learned to drink so that they don't know how to uh, eat. So um, having a, the body cavity, the crop outside of the body helps you to be able to do that. Uh, there are some uh, problems that can occur with the crop though. Um, sometimes the exit for the crop will get blocked and you get what's in called an impacted crop. 
uh, it can get infected um, with the fungus and you or yeast and you get a sour crop. Um, if you catch it early enough, you can usually uh, get the material out, lubricate a little bit with vegetable oil, uh, and basically hope for the best. But if it has been really stretched, uh, it may be non-recoverable. It won't shrink back down again in most cases. Um, and you know, once you get a sour crop, it, it can be very hard to treat. Um, so you usually see that when um, they've been without water for a while, uh, the water comes back on, they, they um, eat too much feed and then the feed gets uh, blocked. Uh, you can also see it when they are on pasture with long uh, foliage. Uh, they prefer the short one, it's easier to get some nutrients out of, but the really long stuff, can uh, get um, bundled up in the crop and cause uh, it a blockage. So those are the two incidences when you typically see uh, a problem with the crop. Uh, if we go on to the actual digestion part from the crop, get the lower esophagus, it goes into the proventriculus um, it's also known as the true stomach. This is where they secrete hydrochloric acid, much like our stomach does. They also secrete pepsin, which is a proteolytic enzyme. That means it digests uh, protein. And so those are secreted in the uh, proventriculus. Um, so that's where digestion starts. And then uh, it goes on to the gizzard, which is called the ventriculus as well. And so the proventriculus just means it comes before the ventriculus or the gizzard. The gizzard is made up of um, two opposing pairs of smooth muscles that uh, grind up the feed. If they are just feeding a mash or or uh, pellets or crumbles, you don't need to provide what's called grit or small uh, stones or pebbles. Um, if you are feeding whole grains or they're on pasture, you have to provide grit or stones if they're not getting it enough of it uh, where they are. Um, those stay in the gizzard and help with the grinding of the material. They'll eventually wear down and pass through. Uh, if you have it on the side, they will uh, eat it as required. So basically the gizzard acts as the bird's teeth because they do not have teeth. Stop on me now. So if we go on then to the, uh, where most of the digestive enzymes and some of the digestion, uh, more digestion takes place, uh, the small intestine is where most of the digestion takes place, and the first part of it is called the duodenum. Um, this pronunciation is very uh, regional, so duodenum, duodenum, uh, you know, are various versions of the same thing. As I said, it's the first section of the small intestine. It's a loop, and the pancreas is in the center of the loop and the pancreas secretes pancreatic juices, which are extremely important in the digestion process. Uh, next is the liver. Liver produces bile. Bile is stored in the gallbladder. This particular gallbladder is very small because it has been eating and therefore emptying quite frequency frequently, uh, so the digestive tract was taken from a chicken that was eating. Um, and there are bile ducts that go from the gallbladder into the duodenum. And just as an aside, the spleen is in the same location. The spleen is not involved in digestion. It's involved in immunology. It's a lymphoid organism. It functions as a blood uh, filtering organ. 
It's also where uh, most of the antibody production starts and it is the main organ for the proliferation of both red and white blood cells. Okay, so the duodenum, as I said, is the site of considerable digestion, some absorption. As I said, it receives the digestive juices from the pancreas via the pancreatic ducts and it receives bile from the liver via the gallbladder. So the pancreas said pancreatic juices includes proteolytic enzymes for protein digestion, amylase uh, for starch digestion and lipase for fat, fat digestion. And of course, the pancreas is very important in insulin production for trying to maintain uh, blood sugar levels also produces glucagon. The two hormones work together to make sure that the blood uh, glucose levels are uh, where they're supposed to be. So the bile salts acts as a detergent. It emulsifies the fat, makes it easier for the enzymes, the lipases, to uh, act on the fat molecules and digest them. The pancreatic uh, the bile also, along with the pancreatic uh, juices, neutralizes the pH of the digesta, of all that material in there, um, because the proventriculus has um, hydrochloric acid, it has a very low pH, but most of the enzymes that are in the small intestine work at a neutral pH, so uh, it needs something to uh, buffer that pH. So most of the chemical breakdown is occurring in the duodenum and the first part of the small intestine. Uh, and then the rest of it is where you get the absorption of it. So both the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine and the jejunum and ileum, um, is, produces many different enzymes. They're referred to as endogenous enzymes because they're produced by the body and they uh, are important for the digestion of proteins and carbohydrates. Chickens, animals do not produce cellulase, which is needed to digest cellulose, which is the main component of plant cell walls, which you see in forages. So that's why chickens cannot digest uh, a lot of, of uh, greenery. Um, some have tried uh, feeding exogenous enzymes. That means that it's not produced by the animal. It's added to the feed to help with digestion. It hasn't been overly successful uh, with poultry. There are other feed enzymes that can be added to solve some of the other um, digestive issues related to some of the alternative feed ingredients, but cellulase has not shown uh, to be economical. And it's also important to note that chickens do not produce lactase, which is needed to digest lactose, which is the sugar in milk. So you should not feed milk products with a lot of lactose to birds since it can cause diarrhea. So we get to the end of the, of the uh, digestive system. There are two blind pouches referred to as uh, cecum. Uh, cecum is singular, cica with an A on the end is plural. And these uh, two pouches contain uh, a mix of microflora that can ferment any of the undigested material that reaches them through the digestive tract. Um, the microbes do produce some vitamins, especially the B vitamins, but because it's at the end of the digestive tract, they really don't get a lot of it. There is some back travel of the uh, digestive backup uh, the small intestine, so some of it gets absorbed. Um, this is very similar to rabbits, only rabbits, rabbits eat their cecal droppings. Chickens typically do not 
eat cecal droppings, um, but they can get some um, vitamins, not a lot. That's how they get uh, some nutrients from foliage. You'll find that some of the waterfowl will have larger cecal to help get uh, a little bit more nutrients out of it. Um, Sika are also important for maintaining the ideal environment for good bacteria. So they keep the pH right, keep the, um, you know, the environment so that the good bacteria grow rather than the bad bacteria. It's also the first place where water reabsorption takes place. Digestion is chemical reactions which have to happen in water. Um, chickens don't wanna lose all that water. So water uh, reabsorption takes place starting in the, the cecal pouches. Uh, the digesta then moves on into the large intestine, which <laughs> surprisingly is smaller than the small intestine. And additional absorption of water takes place there. And then everything ends up at the cloaca. The cloaca is where the digestive tract, the reproductive tract, and the excretory tract all end up. And uh, it's an important area for absorbing any remaining material. So the photograph shows you the uh, reproductive tract and the digestive tract. The excretory uh, tract is a little bit harder to uh, removes, but it empties in there as well. And this, of course, is the female reproductive tract, the male reproductive tract would end there as well. Oops, what happened? What's going on? Let's, let's try again. Okay, so everything then comes out the vent. And um, this is you know, what fecal material looks like. And the white stuff that is on it is the uric acid. And once a day, the cecal droppings will be eliminated as well. I probably should have put a picture in. They are usually darker brown and a little bit uh, runnier, maybe a little gaseous. So the next most important system, um, some would say probably the most important is the reproductive system because eggs are first and foremost a means of reproduction. While we consider them food um, to the bird, they are a means of reproduction. It's important to understand the difference between precocial birds and altricial birds. Precocial birds are well-developed when they hatch and able to get up and walk around on their own very quickly. This includes most of our domestic species of birds, the chickens, the turkeys, the ducks, the geese, the ratites, all that. The exception, exception is pigeons. Pigeons are altricial birds. They're still underdeveloped when they hatch and they require a considerable amount of parental care before they are able to get up and survive on their own. So this includes the pigeons, as I said, and the passerine birds, perching songbirds. Um, if you've ever watched some of the webcams, you can see, you know, the bald eagles, all those with the, the, um, the birds hatching out, they have to be taken care of. So it, because most of our poultry species are precocial, you can buy day-old chicks, poults, ducklings, whatever, and raise them yourself, but you can't go out and buy a day-old pigeon to raise up on its own. So looking first at the female reproductive system, baby birds are hatched, they're not born. The embryo develops inside the hard-shelled egg and all the nutrients that the developing embryo needs, needs to be in the egg. So that is why for us, they're a very nutritional food because everything the, the, the growing embryo needs has to be provided. 
So the female reproductive system is made up of two main parts. The first part is the ovary that has all the developing yolks there. The second part is the oviduct. And it's important to recognize that these are two separate parts. They are not actually connected and that will come up uh, with some of the reproductive problems that we see uh, that can happen because they are two different parts. Uh, this is where sometimes you get yolk peritonitis. So peritonitis is basically an inflammation of the peritoneum, which is the tissue that lines the abdominal wall. So it's typically caused by a bacterial infection, either via the blood or after a rupture of an abdominal organ because the animal was, was roughly hatched. So if the ovulated yolk is released from the ovary, and it's not picked up by the oviduct via the infundibulum, that uh, ovulated yolk can end up in the body cavity. Uh, yolk material is great for growing bacteria. If it's just one yolk that happens, you know, once a year or something, they cannot usually reabsorb it, not a problem. But uh, if there are a lot of them, then the yolk becomes infected which can then cause peritonitis. So there's the two separate parts. So um, some of the signs of peritonitis, we call them internal layers. They may assume a penguin-like stance and that's the case for most of the um, reproductive disorders. They may start laying deformed or soft-shelled eggs if they lay any at all. And they're usually eating and drinking less because you know that's really uncomfortable with the abdominal distension. So there are many different causes of it. The main one I see is the overweight hens. If they are too heavy when they start laying eggs, going from pullets to hens, um, or they're fed a high energy diet then, and becoming fat, then uh, it can cause the problem. It can also be genetic, stress can cause it. If they are having some sort of a situation causing their immune system to not function properly, if they have a different kind of infection already there, uh, if they have too many intestinal parasites, and then you can get ovarian tumors or the oviducts can be uh, blocked. Uh, chickens only have one ovary and oviduct, the left one, uh, but sometimes when you open up a bird, you will see this fluid filled sac, uh, which is the uh, right oviduct that has persisted and become uh, cystic. So they call it a cystic persistent right oviduct. It doesn't usually affect the birds, but it is common to see it when doing a post-mortem examination of a, of a chicken, even a healthy one. So the ovaries here, the pullet chick, when it, the female, when it hatches, has a, a you know, just over 3,000 microscopic yolk follicles. That's all she's ever going to have. She does not produce more. It's not like sperm where they're produced uh, regularly. What she's born with is what she has. The yolks begin to develop after the birds become sexually mature and are photostimulated to start laying eggs. There is an area uh, for each follicle that does not have a, a lot of blood vessels. It's called the stigma or the suture line. And this is typically where the ovulation takes place. If a blood vessel crosses over that thing, when it ovulates, you will get blood in the, the uh, egg. Whoops. Okay, let's, uh, this is a video showing you what ovulation looks like in a live chicken. So the pencil spot was showing you where the rupture is starting. 
Um, as I said, this is done in an um, anesthetized live hand, so you can see what ovulation actually actually looks that like. This was done at Kansas State Agricultural College decades ago. I doubt that um, animal welfare protocols would allow them to do it anymore, but it has been um, uh, what you call it, saved so that I happen to get a copy of it. So as I said, if a blood vessel goes across that line, when it ovulates, you can get blood in the, uh, in the egg. If it's just a little bit, you might get a little spot. Uh, if they have a vitamin K deficiency, vitamin K is important in blood clotting. And uh, so if that's the case, you may get a lot of blood in it. Um, in commercial operations, they typically candle those out. So if you're buying eggs from a store, you should not see blood uh, eggs. Um, if you're using your own home eggs, you may see it a little bit more. Um, unfortunately, brown egg layers, there are some uh, genetic tendencies for more blood spots, and it is harder to candle uh, blood spots out of brown shelled eggs. Uh, you can occasionally get um, double yolked eggs, sometimes even triple yolked, and basically uh, it just means that two yolks were ovulated at the same time. This tends to happen when they first start laying, when a pullet's uh, just coming into production and her hormones aren't quite right. You know, she just ovulates two at the same time. And it also happens near the end of the production cycle uh, when, you know, their hormone system is starting to break down a little bit. You will occasionally, and I've seen them posted like it's, um, you know, this rarity, which it's not, uh, you may get an egg fully formed, uh, it's got a shell on it, and then for some reason it goes back up the reproductive tract. The uh, researchers do not know why it goes back up, but it does. And, uh, and then another, another yolk is ovulated, and um, another shell is made around the already formed egg and the additional yolk. So when you break it open, you have an egg inside an egg. Uh, it does happen. Um, scientists don't know why it happens, but it has been documented that it does happen. So the oviduct is made up of five parts, the infundibulum, the magnum, the isthmus, the shell gland, and the vagina. Uh, the infundibulum is a smooth muscle that has to move itself around the yolk, uh, engulfs the yolk that's been ovulated. Um, it was not possible to film it uh, in place with the hen, so they created a dramatization of what it looks like. So the, the membrane, I mean, the, yeah, the membrane from the infundibulum itself moves over the yolk to engulf it. If fertilization is going to take place, it happens there before any other parts of the egg are added, and it's there about 15 minutes. So it, the sperm have 15 minutes in order to fertilize the ovulated yolk. The next part is the magnum. This is where the egg albumin, also known as the egg white, is added. This is the thick albumin that's added. It is the largest part of the oviduct. That's why it's called magnum, magnum being, being you know, really large. It's 13 inches long, stays there for about three hours. And then it goes into the isthmus. Uh, which is slightly constricted, constricted, which is what an isthmus is, um, the term. So shell membranes are added here. There's two shell membranes, inner and outer shell membrane. Uh, the isthmus is about four inches long, stays for about 75 minutes. 
And the shell membranes add a uh, function as the base for the shell, which is added in the shell gland, also known as the uterus. The shell is made up my, mainly of calcium carbonate. If a pigment is to be added, it is added here. Um, the uterus is about four to five inches long. This is where it stays the longest. It takes over 20 hours for the shell to be added. If the egg is laid prematurely, that's when you typically get a soft shelled uh, egg. So as I said, the shell is made up primarily of calcium carbonate um, and they get that calcium from the feed as well as medullary bones, which I'll get into in a minute. And the shell also has many pores that uh, allow the passage of gases, um, which includes water vapor, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. Uh, the egg then goes to the vagina, which is about four to five inches long. Um, it, the vagina itself does not really take part in egg formation. It's a muscle and the muscle helps to push the egg out of the hen's body. Uh, the technical term for the laying of an egg is oviposition. So uh, as a bit of a tidbit, the developing egg moves down the oviduct small end first. The egg is flipped and laid large end first. Uh, one of the conditions that, that is uh, common with some uh, laying hands is prolapse. And when an egg is laid, the vagina everts out of the cloaca to deliver the egg. This allows the egg to bypass uh, the, the area where fecal and excretory material uh, accumulates in the cloaca so that a clean egg, uncontaminated, it is laid even though they come uh, out to the cloaca. Um, they, you know, the oviduct, the vagina comes out. Once the egg is laid, it, it typically goes back in. If there has been an injury to the vagina, such as from a large or double yolk egg, or if the hen is overly fat, the vagina may not react immediately, leaving it exposed for a short time. This can be uh, attracting other chickens who peck on it and then uh, it doesn't go back in and you get a prolapse. So when the protruding organ is pecked by other hens, the complete oviduct and parts of the uh, adjacent intestinal tract may be pulled out from the abdominal cavity. We call this a peck out. I have seen um, done, you know, postmortems done on dead chickens and you open them up and there's basically no uh, digestive or reproductive tract in there. It got pulled out through the, through the vent. Bleeding from the vent is observed as a result of the pecking. Uh, and alternatively, the vagina can swell and cannot retract, remains prolapsed, and we call that a blowout. So there are two main causes of prolapse. Uh, age of the hen, so prolapse occurs most often at peak egg production when there's a large demand on the hen's metabolism. If you have high light intensity, the hens are more likely to see and be attracted to the glistening material of the oviduct and then pecking can occur and cause damage. Uh, other common causes, underweight pullets at light stimulation. So increasing day length increases egg production. And so if the pullets are underweight at that time, they, they have a higher incidence of prolapse among the flock. Uh, but conversely, if they're overweight at that time, um, they tend to lay larger eggs throughout their production uh, cycle, including laying double yoked eggs, which can damage the, um, the vagina and cause the prolapse. And if they are too fat around the reproductive organs, that will cause muscle weakness. 
Unbalanced feed rations can also be a problem. Um, if there is insufficient calcium in the diet, calcium is a, an, uh, important in the blood, it's important in muscle tone. And so um, if there is a calcium deficiency, the muscles will not work properly. So you're gonna get increased um, internal layers because the infundibulum's not working properly and you're gonna get more prolapse because the muscles for laying the egg and retracting are not functioning properly. The third problem in the reproductive system is uh, being egg bound. Um, basically an egg gets stuck in the oviduct. Egg binding occurs when a hen is straining to produce an egg for more than a few hours. It can cause the uh, death of the bird uh, if the egg is not able to pass. And again, you get that penguin-like stance uh, associated with reproductive problems in uh, chickens. Um, also, the uh, reproductive tract in the infundibulum and in the vagina has sperm storage sites. Uh, these are little pockets that the hen can store sperm uh, after each mating so that um, any eggs laid after a mating uh, are fertilized without the need for mating again. Uh, typically, if they, if they mate once a week, you're going to get uh, good fertilization. Um, for turkeys, they often do artificial insemination and they do it twice a week. Um, if you are doing chicken breeding and you put the wrong rooster in, you typically have to wait three or four weeks after you put the right one in um, before you can pretty much guarantee that um, the offspring are the new rooster's uh, uh, progeny and not the first one. In terms of the male reproductive tract, they have two testes which are located near the back of the chicken. Sperm are produced in the seminiferous tubules in the testes, which are then transported out to the cloaca. And I get a lot of calls, you know, with somebody who ended up with a rooster when they ordered, uh, you know, a bunch of pullets and their, you know, city ordinances do not allow roosters because they crow. Is there a way to, you know, castrate the chicken so that it stops crowing? Um, no. These testes become very hard to get out without damaging the uh, internal organs. Um, so surgery is typically not done on older birds. Caponization is castration of roosters. It's usually done when they're very young. Um, and it's frowned upon these days um, because of animal welfare concerns and the need for caponization to get a tender uh, chicken is not required anymore because of the genetics that we have for the fast growing broilers. The ductus deferens moves the sperm from the testes to the outside. This is similar to the vas deferens in mammals, but it's called a ductus deferens in birds because it's not as developed. Mating requires the rooster to mount the hen. There is no actual penetration. Chick roosters do not have a penis. Um, basically, they uh, have to uh, touch their cloaca to the cloaca of the hen. They call it a cloacal kiss. And uh, the hen everts out her vagina and the sperm is transferred to the hen who then retracts the vagina and takes the sperm in with her. Um, the only bird species that I know of that have a penis would be the waterfowl because they mate in the water. And so if, if this was the form of mating, you would lose most of that sperm into the water. So there is some penetration in waterfowl and I'm told ratites have it, uh, have a penis, which, you know, if you think about the ratites being so big, it's you know, probably needed. 
Uh, birds also have what's known as physiological zero. Fertilization occurs in the infundibulum at the start of the oviduct. It takes 24 to 26 hours for the yolk to travel down the oviduct and the, the egg to get laid. Cell division takes place during this time. So by the time the egg is laid, it does have a uh, small embryo in it, microscopic. Um, so when the egg is laid, it, it cools and embryo development stops, but the embryo does not die. It goes into a type of uh, hiber um, hibernation. And as long as the uh, temperature is kept below physiological zero, no embryo development occurs. Uh, this allows the hen to lay um, eggs over several days, um, say 12 days for you know, 12 eggs. The chicken sits on all 12 eggs at the same time, and they all hatch at the same time instead of having 12 days between the first one that hatches and the second one that hatches. So um, physiological zero allows us to um, you know, get large uh, volumes of eggs and put them in artificial incubators all at once and have large flocks of uh, precocial birds that are able to be raised independent of their mother. So here we have pictures of the of an infertile egg, which is basically uh, just a tiny white spot, the germinal disc on the surface of the yolk. If it is fertilized, that white spot is bigger and there's a clear spot in the middle. Uh, it's like a miniature donut. Um, and that clear spot in the middle is actually the embryo. And something else that one needs to know about uh, birds with rela re, uh, relation to reproduction is that their sex, hormone, sex chromosomes are the reverse of mammals. So while mammals are X and Y, with the females being XX and the males being XY, so that genetically speaking, it is the male that determines the sex of the offspring. For birds, it's the other way around. So the two sex chromosomes for birds are Z and W. And the male is ZZ. It only contributes the Z chromosome. It has no impact on the uh, gender of the offspring. The female is ZW. And it is the female that, genetically speaking, determines the uh, sex of the offspring. Broodiness, I do get calls about broodiness. Um, Broodiness is controlled by hormones, and there are breed differences in the probability of a hen going broody. Some um, breeds, the hens never go broody. Some, they have a high propensity to go broody. You cannot make a hen go broody. Um, she basically determines it herself with the, whatever's going on in her hormones. Uh, there are ways of breaking a hen that's gone broody. You basically put it in a cage with no ability to produce a nest, but make sure she has food and water, leave it where she can see the other hens. And usually, you know, by the end of a week, she uh, has stopped her desire to, to nest because once they're nesting, they're not laying eggs anymore. Oh, this one got out of place, didn't it? Egg bound, some of the common causes, hypocalcemia, calcium tetany is the technical term, hens with a low blood calcium level. So this can happen with a poor quality or unbalanced diet. The hens uh, can be laying excessively large eggs. So that's you know from overweight or being too large at sexual maturity. Uh, starting egg production when they're too small, so they're prematurely starting. Uh, as they get older, there is uh, more of a tendency to it if they've had trauma that can do it. Very obese chickens have a tendency to get egg bound and mycotoxins produced by fungus in feed will also uh, 
cause more hens to go um, get egg bound. So uh, next, because we're running out of time, respiratory system, some of the things that are unique for birds. The respiratory system of birds is important for air exchange as well as body temperature control. If chickens are panting, they are too hot. Chickens cannot sweat. So birds lose heat through radiation, conduction, convection, and evaporation. So, you know, as the blood vessels get closer to the skin surface, you get an increase in heat loss. And as they get farther away, you get a decrease in heat loss. Radiation is when the bird transfers heat from the skin through the air through another, to another object, which could be other birds, or it could be the ground or the walls. High flock densities become a challenge during the hot summer months as they're trying to dissipate excess heat. Uh, transferring heat to cooler objects with which they contact, so metal feeders, some slats, water from sprinklers, so sometimes they spray down birds to try and get them to cool off, but then you have to watch out for water in the litter causing ammonia and all that kind of stuff. And so chickens pant in order to lose heat, they lose water from the respiratory tract. One gram of water can dissipate 540 calories of, of energy, um, nasal cavities, filter dust and bacteria from the air. So mouth breathing while panting increases the incidence of second, uh, secondary bacterial infections. And when panting, CO2 lost through respiration causes the pH of the blood to become more alkaline and reduces the amount of ionized calcium in the blood, which can lead to bone problems and reduced egg production. So the good old domino effect. So the respiratory system of birds is made up of lungs, pneumatic bones, and air sacs. So in humans, when we breathe, our lungs expand and contract with each breath bring in air when they expand and you exhale when you contract. Birds do not do this. The uh, lungs of birds are rigid. They do not expand and contract with each breath. They are in between the ribs and they do not expand and contract um, like they do for um, mammals. They have air sacs. Uh, chickens have nine of them. They have an interclavicular sac up near the, the neck. They have two cervical, two anterior thoracic, two posterior thoracic, and two abdominal air sacs. They act as bellows to um, push air through the lungs. Uh, you have a hard time seeing air sacs unless they're infected, and then they they are no longer transparent. They become cloudy when air sacs uh, are infected. So this gives you an overview of how it takes two breaths to get air through um, the uh, lungs of a chicken. As I said, they are rigid, do not expand and contract. Air passes through the lungs in a single direction and air movement is facilitated through the action of the air sac. So you can see in diagram A, the rear air sacs, abdominal thoracic and, and uh, the cranial thoracic expand and that draws air in from uh, the outside through the trachea. Um, and air goes through the, the lungs into the interclavicular sac from the previous breath. And then in B, the uh, breath, the uh, three back air sacs contract and push air through the, uh, the lungs and um, air comes out of the interclavicular sac and out the trachea. So you can see um, it's the bellows that are either pulling the air in like the interclavicular or pushing it through. So um, air sacs make the, the lungs function and the air sacs uh, 
by the function of the ribs um, can, can get the air movement through. So if you hold a bird too tightly so that its ribs cannot move, uh, it will actually suffocate. And the uh, avian respiratory system is connected to the skeletal system in that they have what's known as pneumatic bones. The lungs, uh, as I said, are rigid, do not expand and contract. Um, and the bones can go into the pneumatic bones, makes them lighter, easier to fly, easier to, for flight. So pneumatic bones are hollow, they're less dense than regular bones. And as I said, they are connected to the respiratory system. Uh, some pneumatic bones, if you break it, uh, they will actually have respiratory distress um, because of the broken bone. The skeletal system is similar to ours. There are some modifications. It's compact, lightweight, and strong. There are a lot of fused bones in the back to give it extra support, whether that is walking like uh, ratites or flying uh, for some of the birds that are still able to fly. So birds have fewer bones. Uh, there's 206 bones in mammals, 150 in chickens. And as I said, the fused bones in the vertebrae of birds. Uh, the breastbone is a special bone of birds. It's also called the sternum or the keel, and it is important for the attachment of the flight muscles. So, uh, you know, when the, the wings go up and down, the muscles uh, contract or expand in order uh, for them that movement to occur. Um, the exception is the ratites, which are flightless birds. So. Uh, some are domesticated, some are not. The ostrich, the rhea, and the emu uh, are domesticated. The timonu, uh, they tried to domesticate it as a game bird, but that didn't work very well. Uh, cassowaries are not overly uh, domesticated. They're not usually raised commercially. Kiwi, the, the na national bird of New Zealand, is an endangered species, actually. Uh, and it is, um, it burrows in the ground uh, in uh, New Zealand. And then one of the big differences is that because they do not fly, they don't use their wings as much, so they do not have that keel bone. So you can see on the skeleton on the left, or well, both skeletons, there is no keel bone. Um, there is some breast muscle, but it doesn't. Uh, go to the keel bone to allow for um, the movement of the wings for flight. So you can see the chicken on the left with the keel bone and the ostrich on the right without the keel bone, and they call them ratites. Um, pneumatic bones I already mentioned, but the other one is the medullary bone, which is a spongy, y'all technically called tubicular, and it serves as a calcium source for the hand. It's sort of a calcium back bank for uh, creating shells. So it will mobilize the, the medullary um, material in order to make the shell and then put back when it's not. Um, it cannot eat enough uh, calcium to make a shell. So uh, it has to pull it from the bones and then put it back in. So after it's been laying for a very long time, that medullary bone can become depleted and um, you can get what's called cage layer fatigue where they have trouble standing up. So you can see pneumatic bones on the uh, top and the medullary bone uh, on the bottom. So those are two special bones of the skeletal system of birds. Um, the main thing that's different in the circulatory system of birds is that it, the uh, red blood cells are nucleated, whereas mammals, they are not. Most of them are produced in the spleen of birds, though some are produced in bone marrow as they are with mammals, but most in the spleen. The excretory system, um, they have kidneys, they're lobed, 
and they're in the back. Uh, so they're not like, you know, our little beanie things. They're uh, on both sides and they filter out the uh, nitrogenous waste material and they excrete it. Chickens don't pee, they, so they don't have urea as the final byproduct of protein metabolism. It is uric acid. Uric acid is not soluble in water, uh, so it helps the birds to conserve water with their excretion. And they put that uric acid crystals on top of the fecal material when uh, they uh, defecate. So some of the resources, um, the, these webinar programs are done through the e-extension. We have a, a work group, the uh, Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice. Uh, we have a website, poultry.extension.org with articles. Uh, all webinars, including this one, are recorded and are posted on the website for later viewing. Um, it usually has upcoming webinars, but I'm a little behind in trying to come up with topics for uh, 2023, so there might not be a January one unless I get some inspiration. Uh, we have a Facebook page where um, we talk about webinars that are coming up, talk about older webinars, talk about news. Uh, a lot of the discussion these days has been on um, the avian influenza that has been a problem and continues to be a problem in both commercial and backyard flocks in the United States. Um, South Dakota seems to be the problem at the moment. Um, the poultry.extension.org does have an ask extension feature where you can type in your question uh, and then it goes through the system and gets uh, distributed to uh, specialists who volunteer to answer questions. They can be slow at responding, especially if you do it on a weekend. They try to send it to the extension agent closest to your state. That's not always possible because not all states have state specialists that do poultry. Uh, you get a faster answer if you uh, email me directly. Um, but make sure you let me know where you are. Different regulations are different for different states. Climates are different. Um, all sorts of other things are different. So um, those are some resources that can help you. And that is the uh, end of my presentation. I went a little over time. I'm sorry. Um, Let's see, uh, get some of these things that were typed in. Oops. Come on. Can you share your slides? No, we just share the recording. Um, I think I missed it. At what temperature uh, do embryos start to divide mature? Uh, embryos start in the, right in as soon as they are fertilized, um, and the body temperature of a chicken is 106. Incubators are usually set at 99.5, but if you go above 75, you're going to get um, some embryo development, but it'll be uh, poor development, and they'll probably die um, if it's you know suboptimal temperatures. Um, yeah, Jackie, I think you could take any. Oops, come on, just a thing. Um, any portion of this webinar expand on it or slow down and go more day. Yeah, this was supposed to be um, an overview, um, and I was thinking um, that the first talk in in 2023 would be specifically on the reproductive tract and some of the issues that are associated with uh, reproduction, like the prolapse, you know, how do you deal with it and the, the um, egg bound and um, all those types of things. Um, I have seen, um, you know, for pets, I mean, it's not usually done for general livestock, but um, 
I have seen veterinarians do hysterectomies, full hysterectomies on um, uh, hens that have a tendency to be egg bound so that you know, the pet can live. Uh, it's obviously very expensive and I'm not sure of the success rate. Um, and yes, uh, trying to include more, especially on the digestive system of geese and ducks since they are slightly different. Um, as I said, this is recorded. All recordings are posted on our website. Um, and you can just share the link uh, with them to see it um, because I am in Mozambique at the moment. Um, so uh, it takes a, it may take a while depending on the, uh, in the, uh, what do you call it? Internet. Um, you know, we would like to see a live necropsy uh, with the technology. It's a little hard. We did do a webinar on uh, how to do a necropsy, um, not a live one, but um, I can talk to our veterinarians to see if uh, they would do it. Uh, Spilingonitis, yeah, it's not spelled correctly, but yeah, I think that's what they call it when they take everything out. Okay. So I'm not seeing any more uh, questions. Um, it is 11 o'clock here. So um, I'm going to close this off and uh, try and go to bed and get up early tomorrow to help with the poultry project that I am working with uh, here in Mozambique. So I hope everyone has a, a good evening. Um, and if you have any topics other than the ones that I just mentioned already, uh, feel free to email me uh, as I try to put together our list of webinars. I'm not the only one who does the webinars. Um, we have some other um, thing. Will there be a recording to view? Yes, uh, this was recorded and uh, it's not going to happen tonight for being posted because I'm going to bed. I'm jet lagged. I only just got here today. Um, it will probably get posted sometime tomorrow. I usually put it on um, the Facebook page when it's ready to go. It's a YouTube channel that we use. Um, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, um, then you can um, see all the past ones and you get first notification when they um, become available. So, um, so yes, it is recorded webinar. The recording will be put up um, today, uh, tomorrow or the next day, um, depending on my availability with the project I'm working on. So everybody have a good evening. Merry Christmas, um, happy Hanukkah, whatever uh, your uh, celebration is at the end of the year and uh, all the best for next year. So thank you very much. Everybody take care.